Yeah, talking freedom and liberation. Worldwide, not just only for the nation. A radical guy, it's time to make changes. Bringing interviews and radical education. Yeah, Welcome yeah, to a radical a podcast. Future, what we really I'm your host, Jason Bayless. We dive into the heart of activism here, seeking out the stories and ideas that frequently go unheard in mainstream narratives. We're all about illuminating the diverse philosophies and strategies at the core of radical movements through our open discussions and in-depth examinations. Today, we're charting a course through the complex history and contemporary state of anarchism in the United States. We'll be exploring its roots, rise, suppression, and resurgence. Additionally, we'll spotlight a current event in our radical and anarchist news segment, critically analyzing a recent incident in Atlanta, Georgia. Specifically, we'll examine how the narrative of blaming anarchists is often wielded to stifle dissent. In our About a Radical Guide segment, we're excited to feature an autonomous collective in Indonesia. They're making a real difference in their community through ethical fashion and the creation of safe spaces. So join us for an enlightening journey of exploration and critical thinking. You're listening to a Radical Podcast. Let's go! Let's turn to the city of Atlanta, Georgia, where recent acts of vandalism against police facilities have drawn heavy condemnation from city officials. During a press conference, Atlanta Mayor Andre Dickens pointed a finger at anarchists, attributing the acts to a desire for destruction. These individuals are anarchists. They want to destroy, Mayor Dickens was quoted saying. As we listen to the mayor's statement, it's important to consider the broader context. Using the term anarchist as a pejorative is not a new tactic. It's a label that has often been applied to justify state control and suppression measures, as we will delve more deeply into our next section. It's also worth mentioning that these incidents come amidst growing tension over developing a new Atlanta public safety training facility in DeKalb County. This project has sparked widespread protest. Known as the Stop Cop City protests, these demonstrations have highlighted local community members' concerns over resource allocation and the potential impacts of the new facility on their communities. While we can't say who is responsible for these acts of vandalism, we can consider the mayor's response as part of a larger narrative that often uses the term anarchist as a scapegoat in the face of dissent. As we explore the historical pattern of blaming anarchists in our next section, we'll examine how this term has been leveraged to suppress protest voices and justify state control measures. So stay tuned for more nuanced discussions as we continue to challenge the narratives that frame our understanding of anarchism. A Radical Guide stands in solidarity with the Stop Cop City protests and efforts. A radical guide, that's what this is. Highlighting the diverse world of resistance. This week, in the Resistance Around the World segment, we dive into the complex history of anarchist suppression in the United States. To fully grasp the nuances of this story, we must first understand what anarchism represents. At its core, it's a philosophy that rejects hierarchies seen as unjust and advocates for a society based on voluntary cooperation and mutual aid. However, it's not a monolith. Anarchism encompasses a spectrum of ideologies, from anarcho-syndicalism to anarcho-communism to individualist anarchism, each proposing different ways of structuring society and resisting oppression. The United States' historical stance on anarchism has often been characterized by attempts to suppress the ideology and its advocates. One pivotal moment that brought anarchism to the fore of national consciousness was the Haymarket Affair. The state seized this event as an opportunity to steer public sentiment against the anarchist movement, creating a climate of fear and suspicion that set the stage for aggressive actions against anarchists. The assassination of President McKinley by Leon Cholgos, an avowed anarchist, further intensified these tensions, giving the state more ammunition to push for stringent control measures and policies. In the wake of these events, a series of legislative actions were set in motion to control or suppress anarchists, which we'll explore in greater detail throughout this segment. Despite these efforts, anarchist thought has had a profound influence on movements for social change. The principles of mutual aid, direct action, and horizontal organization have shaped many labor movements and civil rights struggles, reminding us that the spirit of anarchism is deeply entwined with the struggle for justice. Today, we're going to take a closer look at how this suppression has taken shape, how it's influenced both the state and the anarchist movement, and how anarchists have resisted and continue to resist today. 
So join us as we embark on this journey through the past and into the present. In the latter part of the 19th and the early 20th century, anarchism became a notable force in social and political movements, particularly within labor struggles. One of the most significant early encounters between anarchists and the authorities occurred in 1886 at the Haymarket Square in Chicago. At a rally advocating for an eight-hour workday, an unidentified individual threw a bomb into the crowd, sparking a riot that killed seven police officers and at least four civilians. The aftermath was a spectacle of fear and retribution. The authorities initiated immediate crackdowns, carrying out wide-ranging raids and arrests targeting known and suspected anarchists. Accused of orchestrating the violence, the anarchist community was subjected to a harsh and sweeping inquisition. This massive wave of repression further fueled panic and mistrust toward anarchists. Ultimately, eight prominent anarchists were controversially tried for murder. Despite a lack of concrete evidence linking them to the bomb throwing, four were executed, one committed suicide in prison, and the remaining three were pardoned in 1893 due to public outcry over the unjust trial. The Haymarket Affair sent shockwaves through society, reinforcing the association of anarchism with violence in the public imagination, while also catalyzing labor movements across the country. The influence of anarchism was not confined to high-profile incidents of conflict. It significantly shaped the labor struggles of the period. Anarchist principles such as direct action and workers' self-management informed many labor movements' strategies and goals. Perhaps the most explicit example of this is the Industrial Workers of the World, IWW, a radical union formed in 1905. Drawing heavily from anarcho-syndicalist principles, the IWW advocated for abolishing the wage system and establishing a worker society. Their strategies included organizing strikes and promoting solidarity between different labor sectors, aiming for a unified general strike to halt the capitalist system. The impact of the IWW and other anarchist-influenced labor movements was profound. They won significant concessions for workers, including improved wages and working conditions, and introduced the notion of workers' rights into the public discourse. Yet their radical approach also earned them the ire of both employers and the state, which reacted with harsh suppression measures, setting a precedent for future responses to anarchist activities. The following segments will discuss how this period of heightened anarchist activity was met with corresponding suppression measures from the government, notably through legislation and trials that marked a significant crackdown on anarchist activity. The U.S. government enacted several measures to curtail the anarchist movement in response to the rising tide of anarchist activities. These efforts were primarily legislative and manifested in notable trials against alleged anarchists. One significant piece of legislation was the Anarchist Exclusion Act of 1918, also known as the Immigration Act of 1918. This law dramatically escalated the U.S. government's response to anarchism. The Anarchist Exclusion Act of 1918 was a significant amendment to the Immigration Act of 1917, furthering the restrictions on the types of individuals permitted into the United States. This act encompassed not only anarchists, but also individuals with epilepsy, beggars, and those involved in prostitution. The legislation broadly excluded immigrants who were anarchists, or persons who believe in or advocate the overthrow by force or violence of the government of the United States, or of all government or of all forms of law, or the assassination of public officials. The inclusion of anarchists in the act reflected the U.S. government's fear and suspicion of radical ideologies following the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. While anarchists had previously been seen as a potential threat, the Russian Revolution spurred the U.S. government to enact more severe restrictions to prevent the importation of these ideologies. Importantly, the act prevented more than just anarchists from entering the country. It also provided for the deportation of anarchists already residing in the United States. It was one of the first times the U.S. government linked immigration policy with political ideology, setting a precedent for future immigration laws. This act, alongside the broader Red Scare, resulted in a significant clampdown on radical political activity. Thousands of immigrants were deported under the act, with the most infamous deportations occurring during the Palmer Raids of 1919 to 1920. These raids, organized by then Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, targeted radicals, leading to the arrest of thousands of individuals 
and the deportation of hundreds. The Anarchist Exclusion Act remained a significant part of U.S. immigration law for much of the 20th century. However, its provisions were largely repealed by the Immigration Act of 1990. Under current U.S. immigration law, there is no explicit mention of anarchists. However, those who advocate the overthrow of the government by force or violence are still barred from becoming U.S. citizens. The act had significant immediate and long-term effects. In the short term, it led to numerous deportations, the most infamous of which occurred during the Palmer raids of the first Red Scare, during which thousands of suspected radicals were arrested and hundreds were deported. In the longer term, the act set a precedent for using immigration law as a tool of political repression. This strategy would be repeated in subsequent periods of political unrest. The effectiveness of the act in deterring anarchist activity is debatable. While it undoubtedly disrupted many radical organizations and instilled fear within radical circles, it also fostered resentment and defiance among those targeted, further fueling their resistance. Another strategy used by the government to suppress anarchism was through highly publicized trials. Perhaps the most famous of these is the trial of Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, two Italian immigrants and self-proclaimed anarchists. Sacco and Vanzetti were charged with robbery and murder in 1920. Their trial became an international cause célèbre, as many believed that their anarchist beliefs, rather than the evidence presented, were the real reason for their prosecution. Despite widespread protests and appeals, Sacco and Vanzetti were executed in 1927. Their trial and execution are considered significant moments in U.S. history, reflecting the intense xenophobia, anti-radical sentiment, and fear of the other prevalent during this period. The Sacco and Vanzetti case, along with the broader legislative and political assault on anarchism, marked a period of significant governmental suppression against anarchism in the United States. These actions were not isolated incidents, but rather part of a larger strategy to curb radical ideology's influence on American society. The following sections will explore how this pattern of suppression continued throughout the 20th century and into the present day. The first Red Scare was marked by the involvement of several key figures, notably Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer and J. Edgar Hoover. Hoover at the time was the head of the Justice Department's newly formed General Intelligence Division, sometimes referred to as the Radical Division. The Justice Department's Radical Division was a specialized agency created in the midst of the first Red Scare to investigate and disrupt the activities of radical movements within the United States. It was designed to collect intelligence on radical groups and extensively used covert operations and informants to infiltrate these organizations. The division primarily focused on socialist, communist, and anarchist groups, seeing these ideologies as significant threats to American societal order and stability. The Industrial Workers of the World, IWW, a radical labor union often associated with anarchism and socialism, was among the division's main targets. Under Hoover's leadership, the division launched extensive investigations into the IWW, leading to numerous arrests and the suppression of the union's activities. Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer was another key figure during this period. Known for his vigorous prosecution of suspected radicals, Palmer directed the Justice Department's actions during the first Red Scare, including the infamous Palmer Raids. These actions, aimed at arresting and deporting radical leftists, were based on intelligence gathered by Hoover's division. Among the notable events of this period was the Seattle General Strike of 1919, one of the most significant labor actions in American history. The strike was a five-day general work stoppage from February 6 to 11, 1919. An estimated 65,000 workers across various industries in Seattle, Washington, participated in the strike, effectively bringing the city to a standstill. The reasons behind the strike were multifaceted, involving a complex mix of economic, social, and political factors. Key among these was the demand for better wages and working conditions, exacerbated by the economic instability following World War I. The strike was peaceful and well-organized, with the strikers even setting up their own kitchens to feed the city's inhabitants. Nevertheless, the breadth and scale of the strike, as well as its association with radical labor groups, caused significant fear and anxiety among the city's establishment and the national government. 
the response to the strike was forceful. Seattle's mayor, Ole Hansen, took a hardline stance against the strikers, mobilizing the police force and successfully pressuring the labor unions to end the strike. When the workers returned to work on February 11th, Hansen declared that he had stopped a communist revolution, dramatically contributing to the National Red Scare. The Seattle general strike profoundly impacted the public perception of labor movements and radical ideologies. The strike was widely portrayed as a dangerous uprising, further fueling the fear of radical ideologies. The event also marked a significant turning point in the labor movement, revealing both the power of collective action and the resistance it could provoke. This, in turn, shaped the strategies and approaches of labor activists and radical groups in the years to come. A defining incident of this period was the 1919 anarchist bombings, an orchestrated series of bombings and attempted bombings carried out by anarchist extremists from April to June of that year. These acts of violence were primarily orchestrated by the Gallianists, followers of the Italian anarchist Luigi Galliani, who advocated for violent revolution and believed in propaganda by the deed which justified the use of violence as a means to provoke and inspire revolutionary action. Over this period, the Gallianists targeted anti-immigration politicians, anti-anarchist officials, and prominent businessmen with 36 mail bombs. In addition, eight large bombs were detonated in several cities across the country. While these attacks largely failed to harm their intended targets, they resulted in several deaths, injuries, and significant property damage. These bombings coming on the heels of the Seattle general strike, significantly heightened the climate of fear during the first Red Scare. The perceived threat of a widespread and dangerous radical conspiracy led to a sharp increase in government efforts to suppress anarchists and other radical groups. The climate of anxiety, amplified by the Seattle general strike and the 1919 anarchist bombings, provided the U.S. government an opportunity to justify an aggressive crackdown on radical activities, most notably in the form of the Palmer Raids. So where does this all lead us? After the turbulence of the Palmer Raids and the first Red Scare, anarchist thought was pushed to the fringes of American society. But as we know, ideas don't just disappear. As America navigated the post-World War II era, these suppressed anarchist ideologies were quietly percolating beneath the surface. Then came the 1960s and 70s, a period marked by profound social and political upheaval. Everything from civil rights to the Vietnam War to the women's liberation movement was causing people to question the status quo. In many ways, the counterculture of this era represented a sharp break from societal norms, and it's here that we see the sparks of anarchism begin to glow brighter once again. The counterculture movement of the 1960s and 1970s represented a dramatic shift in societal norms, and it was during this time that anarchist thought saw a resurgence. This period, characterized by the civil rights movement, vehement opposition to the Vietnam War, and the rise of second-wave feminism, bred widespread disillusionment with traditional political structures and mainstream societal norms. A notable group that emerged from this period was the Youth International Party, better known as the Yippies, Formed in 1967 by social and political activists Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, and others, the Yippies embodied many principles of anarchism. They were known for their theatrical public protests against the capitalist system and the Vietnam War. For example, at the 1968 Democratic National Convention, Yippies famously nominated a pig named Pigasus the Immortal as their presidential candidate, demonstrating their disdain for the American political system. In response to the resurgence of anarchism and other radical ideologies, the U.S. government, specifically the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, created the counterintelligence program, COINTELPRO. Its objective was to survey, infiltrate, discredit, and disrupt domestic political organizations perceived as subversive. Anarchist groups and other radical movements aligned with anarchist thought were targeted as part of COINTELPRO's suppression efforts. COINTELPRO didn't limit its focus to radical white groups like the Yippies. Many of their resources targeted black activist groups, notably the Black Panther Party. Founded in 1966 by Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale, the Black Panther Party called for an end to police brutality, decent housing, full employment, and African-American self-determination. 
However, their support for armed self-defense and Marxist ideology put them under intense scrutiny from law enforcement, particularly the FBI. Under the direction of J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI saw the Black Panther Party as a black nationalist hate group, viewing it as one of the biggest threats to the country's internal security. The tactics used by COINTELPRO against the Panthers were ruthless, ranging from infiltration and surveillance to sowing discord within the organization. The FBI's actions significantly weakened the organization and contributed to its decline in the early 1970s. Critics see these actions as a stark example of government overreach and suppression of political dissent and racial justice movements. Groups like the Yippies also found themselves in the crosshairs of COINTELPRO. FBI surveillance and disruptive activities undermined their efforts to organize protests and spread fear among members. The New Left movement espousing some anarchist ideologies was another target of COINTELPRO. These concerted efforts formed a significant part of the government's broader campaign to suppress radical political activity during this period. Several influential figures were pivotal in the development of anarchist thought during this period. One such figure was Murray Bookchin, who was central in advancing the anarchist theory of social ecology and libertarian municipalism. Bookchin's work emphasized the importance of community, direct democracy, and ecology in the structure of society, and he criticized the hierarchical nature of modern political and social systems. The 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago was another significant event during this period. Here, the Yippies and other radical groups carried out extensive protests that drew national attention. While these groups had various grievances, they were united in rejecting the established political order. Their protests were met with heavy-handed police and National Guard responses, illustrating the government's ongoing efforts to suppress anarchism. This period, thus, was characterized by a significant resurgence in anarchist thought alongside government efforts to suppress it. Figures like Bookchin and groups like the Yippies were critical in bringing anarchist ideas into the mainstream discourse. Despite government suppression efforts like those under COINTELPRO, anarchism continued influencing various political and social movements into the late 20th century and beyond. After the 9-11's terrorist attacks, the U.S. government implemented various measures to strengthen national security. A centerpiece of these efforts was the USA Patriot Act. Its full title, Uniting and Strengthening America by Providing Appropriate Tools, required to intercept and obstruct terrorism, hints at its purpose. Signed into law in October 2001, it dramatically expanded the government's surveillance and law enforcement powers. The act is divided into 10 titles, each addressing different aspects of counterterrorism. The increased surveillance powers allow law enforcement agencies to gather information through wiretaps, surveillance of electronic communications, and search warrants more readily. New restrictions were placed on financial transactions that could potentially fund terrorism. The act also imposed harsher penalties for crimes linked to terrorism and broadened the powers to detain and deport suspected terrorists. Perhaps most critically for our conversation, the act expanded the definition of material support for terrorism, which has implications for radical groups, including anarchists. Some have argued that this broad definition can be applied to many forms of protest and civil disobedience, allowing the government to categorize these activities as terrorism. This represents a major shift in how dissent is perceived and handled legally. But that's not the end of the story. In 2006, we saw the introduction of another piece of legislation, the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, or AETA. While ostensibly aimed at protecting animal enterprises from violent or destructive protests, its broad language raised serious concerns about freedom of speech and assembly. Critics claimed that the act could criminalize many protest activities, effectively intimidating activists, and suppressing dissent. A striking example of how this legislation has been applied involves the case of the Shack 7, seven individuals associated with Stop Huntingdon Animal Cruelty, an international animal rights campaign. In 2006, these individuals were charged with animal enterprise terrorism under the AETA for their website, which posted information about protests and direct actions. Despite not personally engaging in any violent or destructive acts, they were held accountable for the actions others took after reading their website, and all seven were found guilty. Alongside these legislative changes, we've seen what's referred to as the Green Scare. 
It's a term derived from the Red Scare of the 20th century and describes the government's response to environmental and animal rights activism in the post-9-11 era. Many activists have been prosecuted as terrorists for actions that previously might have been treated as civil disobedience or vandalism. This approach has had a chilling effect on activism in these fields, stifling direct action tactics often associated with anarchist movements. Although designed to maintain national security, all these measures have significantly impacted radical ideologies, including anarchism. Activists advocating radical change have been thrust into an increasingly complex and risky legal environment. These shifts have fundamentally altered the landscape for dissent in the United States, marking a significant chapter in the history of anarchist suppression. Fast forward to today, and we see that the spirit of anarchism is still very much alive and active in the United States. Many diverse anarchist philosophies continue to influence political thought, social movements, and cultural expressions. These range from anarcho-syndicalism, advocating for labor rights and self-managed cooperative workplaces, to eco-anarchism, a response to environmental crises and climate change. Across the country, active anarchist collectives, communities, and individuals put these philosophies into action. These contemporary anarchists organize around issues like housing rights, workers' rights, social justice, environmental conservation, and anti-fascist actions, just to name a few. Uh, however, the effectiveness and impact of these groups is a matter of perspective. Some see them as a powerful force challenging existing power structures and fighting for a more equitable society. Others view them as disruptive and chaotic or dismiss them as utopian dreamers. What's clear is that they are a part of the ongoing dialogue and struggle over the shape of our society. But just as in the past, these contemporary anarchist movements face significant challenges, particularly from government surveillance and suppression. Post 9 11 the U.S. has implemented a wide array of surveillance programs that have been used to monitor potential foreign threats and domestic groups perceived as radical or subversive. Even in 2023, these issues persist as the Biden administration has formally urged Congress to reauthorize a high-profile warrantless surveillance program known as Section 702. This controversial legislation, a remnant of the George W. Bush era, allows the U.S. government to collect the communications of targeted foreigners abroad, compelling service providers like Google and networks like Verizon to provide copies of messages, internet data, and intercepted phone call information. However, critics of the legislation argue that Section 702 has been used as a backdoor for the FBI and other agencies to surveil Americans. While the act ostensibly targets foreigners, American citizens on the other end of these conversations or communications also have their data collected and stored. This indirect form of surveillance on U.S. citizens has raised significant concerns about violating privacy rights and civil liberties. The implications of reauthorizing such a program are immense. While the government argues that it is crucial for collecting intelligence on foreign threats, the potential for misuse and violation of civil liberties remains a significant concern particularly for domestic groups deemed radical or subversive. Modern surveillance efforts continue to target anarchist groups and individuals, seeking to disrupt their activities and neutralize what the government perceives as threats. We see this in the increased policing and surveillance of environmental activists, the broad characterization of Antifa as domestic terrorists, and the use of grand juries to pressure activists into revealing information about their peers. These suppression efforts have real palpable impacts on anarchism and radical movements in the U.S. They instill fear, sow division, deter participation, and divert resources away from activism and towards legal defense. But as history has shown us, such efforts also galvanize resistance, resilience, and the continued struggle for a more equitable and free society. As we wrap up this deep dive into the history of anarchist suppression in the United States, it's important to reflect on the threads we've traced through over a century of social and political history. From the labor strikes and the Red Scare of the early 20th century, through the counterculture movements and government surveillance programs of the mid to late 20th century, to the renewed fears of radicalism and legislation that shaped the post-9-11 era and beyond, we see the recurrence of a pattern, a dance of dissent and suppression, ideology and authority. The implications of this history are far-reaching. 
the anarchist ideas of questioning authority, of seeking a society based on voluntary cooperation, continue to influence modern movements. However, these ideas are often met with significant resistance, and this is where we see the reality of anarchist suppression. The COINTELPRO operations, the Patriot Act, and the reauthorization of Section 702 are all pieces of a larger puzzle that illustrates a consistent government response to perceived threats against the established order. Looking towards the future, the question then becomes, what will the place of anarchism be in the U.S.? With the shifting political landscape, the evolution of technology, and changing societal norms, there are new avenues for expression and suppression. Anarchism, being as much a critique of the existing order as it is a blueprint for a new one, will likely continue evolving and adapting to these changes. The ongoing relationship between anarchism and the state continues to be characterized by a tension between the desire for radical change and the impulse towards order and control. Whether viewed as a threat to social stability or a vital challenge to oppressive power structures, anarchism remains a significant factor in the landscape of American political thought. Its history and future in the U.S. are a stark reminder of the enduring struggle for freedom, equity, and autonomy. Radical education, yeah, yeah, a better future, what we really need, not rooted in capitalism. Today we're spotlighting the collective known as Needle and Bitch a DIY handmade crafts collective based in Bantul, Indonesia. From bags to notebooks, aprons to patches, Needle and Bitch are crafters extraordinaire. And their purpose? It's not just about creating goods, but supporting their collective needs and standing autonomously without reliance on NGOs or other funding. Their work stands at the intersection of creativity, autonomy, and radical expression. Every piece they make, whether from new or reused materials, serves as a platform to communicate their views and advocate for the issues that matter to them. But it doesn't stop there. What makes Needle and Bitch truly radical is their commitment to ethical fashion and collective working. There are no bosses here, no employees, just a collective of individuals working together in pursuit of a shared vision. Moreover, Needle and Bitch is a safe space. They welcome individuals of all genders and sexual orientations, but it's more than just a physical location. It's a space, a situation, and a condition they've created to counteract the often exclusionary tendencies of our sexist, patriarchal, and homophobic society. In a world where spaces like these are far too rare, Needle and Bitch stands as a beacon of inclusive, radical expression. Their work goes beyond the crafts they create, serving as a testament to the power of collective action and the radical potential of DIY culture. For more on Needle and Bitch and how you can support their incredible work, check out our A Radical Guide feature on them at radicalguide.com. Let's go. That wraps up this episode of A Radical Podcast, where we've taken a deep dive into the complex history of anarchism in the United States, from the Haymarket Affair of the 19th century to present-day surveillance and suppression efforts. We've also examined how the state and media often scapegoat anarchists to justify their actions and push negative narratives about anarchism. From our news segment, we analyzed recent incidents in Atlanta and the city officials' response, pointing out the broader pattern of blaming anarchists in times of dissent. Finally, we showcased the collective efforts of Needle and Bitch, a DIY crafts group based in Indonesia, who operate autonomously while creating a safe space for everyone, regardless of sex or sexual orientation. Remember, a Radical Guide is a platform built by and for radicals like you. We depend on the contributions of our community to continue growing and creating content. You can support us by adding a location to our map, helping us build a comprehensive guide to radical spaces worldwide. Financial support is also greatly appreciated and crucial to our work. You can visit RadicalGuide.com to learn how to support. Lastly, don't forget to subscribe to A Radical Guide wherever you consume content whether through our newsletter, your podcast platform of choice, YouTube, or directly on our website at RadicalGuide.com. Your engagement and support help keep this platform alive and thriving. Thank you for joining us today on A Radical Podcast. 
I am grateful you spent this time with us. Hey. Yeah, talking freedom and liberation. Uh-huh. Worldwide, not just only for the nation. A radical guy, it's time to make changes. Bringing interviews and radical education. Yeah, yeah, a better future, what we really need. Not rooted in capitalism or supremacy. Yeah, yeah, trust you, don't want to miss it. We bring the truth right to you. The past, present, and future, let's go. Hey. A radical guy, that's what this is. Highlighting the diverse world of resistance. Let's go.